All right. Hello, everybody, again. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. This is John Mullins from Themis. And the title of today's webinar will be Oracle PL SQL Best Practices Part 1. All right, a couple things as we get started here. Um, you see my email address there on the screen, jmullins at themasinc.com. Uh, with, you know, with the time frame that we have today, if you have any questions as we go throughout the webinar, feel free to send me some of those questions to that email address. Um, with the time that we have, it's often difficult to address the questions actually during the webinar part there. Um, I tried to anticipate some of the questions and some of the material that might come up here shortly. But if you do have questions, feel free to send them to me at that email address again, jmullins at themasync.com. Also, um, if you haven't been out to our, our website lately uh, for Themis, I know many of you are former students or you've worked with some of the students that we've had in our classes before. Right? Make sure you go out to our website, uh, www.themisinc.com. It's been totally redone. It's fantastic looking. Um, very easy to get around, very easy to find what you're looking for. Lots of resources out there, including all the information um, about past webinars that we've had as well. So if you go out there, there'll be a webinars tab across the top. You can click on that and see some of the, the past webinars that we've had, not only for Oracle, but also for DB2 and Java, CICS, and lots of other topics out there also. Um, you can get copies of the slides from the webinars. You can also um, see the recordings of the webinars out there as well. So currently, right now, the slides for today's webinar are available out there on our website at themasync.com. And then uh, shortly after the webinar has concluded and the recording has had a chance to be formatted, the recording will be put out there as well. Okay, so like I said, a fantastic a uh, new website for us at themasync.com. Make sure you go out there. You can see a list of our courses, a uh, list of who to contact if you need more information about those. Um, make sure you visit that. All right. Let's, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started today. So I recognize a lot of the names from people in the attendee list there, so uh, it's good to, to see you again. Um, if you've taken some of our Oracle classes in the past, either PL SQL, SQL, or whatever. Um, and today's topic has to do directly with PL SQL. You know that in those classes, we talk a lot more about just syntax of SQL or syntax of PL SQL. We do talk about, you know, what's everybody else doing with PL SQL? Um, what, what's the right way to do it, just rather than here's a way to do it? And so that's what today's presentation is kind of all about. We're going to um, talk about some of the best practices. Now, these best practices that I've included today, these are just some that have kind of come to my mind. Um, they're kind of in a random order of uh, just kind of the first thoughts that I had on some of the best practices that are out there. If you've taken those classes before, you also are familiar with who I am. Um, again, my name is John Mullins, and I'm representing Themis, Inc., uh, my, you know a little bit about my background experience if you've been in some of my classes, but I've been using Oracle for quite some time since the 1980s and uh, started off with Oracle version 5, which didn't have a whole lot of features in it. Um, so Oracle's come a long way since then for sure, as everybody knows. I'm also an Oracle certified professional DBA and just information for people who aren't familiar with me, certified technical trainer and uh, currently do short-term consulting and cla uh, classroom training, whether it be online classes, in-person in type classes. Um, I do presentations at uh, user groups. Um, next, In fact, next week, if you happen to be in the area, down in San Antonio, Texas, I'll be doing a presentation on the Oracle result cache to the San Antonio Oracle user group. And so feel free to stop by for that. That's going to be next Thursday. Uh, March 30th in the evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. So feel free to stop by for that if you're out and about and in the South Central Texas area. Many of you are familiar with Themis as well as we 
get ready to start this webinar here. But Themis has been around for a long time. I've taught a lot of students. Uh, well known for DB2, Oracle, SQL Server, Java, operating system type training that's out there. But whether again, like whether it's in person, online, uh, uh, customized training. So if you go out to our website and you see course outlines out there and it doesn't, and there's some topics that you really need that you don't see out there or you want to remove topics, we can certainly customize those for you as well. That's one of our one of our really big benefits that we provide to our customers out there. And again, go out to themasync.com, you'll see that wonderful new website out there. All right, in today's topic, we're going to be talking about best practices. And related to that, here's some other courses that are coming up. So if you, if you enjoy today's topic out there, um, feel free to look at some of these classes that are coming up. We have an introduction to PL SQL in June, advanced PL SQL also in June, and then the uh, troubles, and this one's coming right up, uh, not too far down the road, troubleshooting, debugging, and tuning Oracle PL SQL programs. That's a very popular course, a two-day class, um, going to run on May 8th. So feel free to look into those. And we can also add other classes for other dates as well if you have any interest in that. All right, let's get into the webinar part here. I know, I know that's what everybody's here for, and everybody's time is very valuable, so I don't want to keep you longer than, than we need to. So we're going to look at some best practices. And these are just things, like I said, that have, through my experience and background, just kind of popped in my mind for, for the time frame that we have today. Notice I gave it a part one, which kind of implies that there's going to be a part two, and there could very well be there too, because... There are, there are just dozens and dozens of best practices that we can be following. And, and these aren't meant to be difficult. Um, some of them, you'll see them and you'll say, well, that's pretty obvious, and that's true. Um, you know, based on our audience makeup for today and such, you know, we're going to be looking at things anywhere from some things that are very basic and to more intermediate to advanced as well. But uh, today's topic isn't meant to be uh, advanced in nature. It's meant to be... Uh, give us good suggestion, good direction, good guidelines for, for what a good PL SQL program might entail. So that's what we're going to look at. Now the way that I've kind of broken it up today, I, I wanted to make it a little bit different for everybody. And so what I've done is uh, I've kind of broken code into, okay, instead of doing your code this way, maybe we should do it this way. So I'm going to show you for each of these different areas, I'm going to show you kind of a piece of code with maybe it'll work, it works perfectly fine, but maybe here's a better way to do it. And by better way, we mean that it could be more readable, it could be easier to maintain, it could give us a performance benefit, um, it's more reliable, um, it's going to give us some things that the other code won't give us, um, maybe like certain exceptions or things like that. And so the the code that, that we look at second with each one of these uh, topics will kind of represent that. So all the code in here has been tested and works perfectly fine. And like I said, you can get a copy of today's slides at themasync.com slash webinars or get that from the tab out there on our website. Okay, so that's the way it'll kind of be presented and structured today. Here's some code, but may, maybe you should write it differently. Now, you may have a different idea on a best practice there. You may, you know, these are just ideas that are coming from me and from my experience and background and working with lots of different clients uh, throughout the world. Um, but everybody has a different idea on, okay, we should do things this way versus that way. All right, so keep that in mind too. These are just suggestions that might help in your environment there. And you might be doing all these as well. These are also suggestions that could um, be input into, if you have this type, kind of thing, into a PL SQL standards document that everybody in your organization or your company follows. Um, we know that from previous webinars, from previous classes that we've taught, and from doing consulting as well, that some places have a very good structured PL SQL standards document that people follow and that those standards are enforced. Other people have standards and they're not enforced very well. Um, some people don't have standards at all. Um, I have some people in class, they'll tell me that, well, everybody kind of has their own standard out there. Okay, so these can be uh, 
input into those standards documents if that's something that you're currently working on or if something you currently have and you want to add to it. All right, <clears throat> with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump in and look at the first one here. All right, I'm going to kind of pause on these because some of these have a little bit of code that you may want to kind of let sink in just a bit. Like I said, the code that we're going to look at today is not very difficult code but it's meant to kind of demonstrate a point. All right, here's the first one here. I, I, the first one here is really pretty simple. Um, you can see here I've got a variable called V underscore amount, and I'm assigning it a data type, and I'm going to initialize it in the declare section up there. But you can see that I've, and you'll see that in a lot of the code today, that I'm going to hard code some of the ideas in there just to demonstrate the point. So you can see here I'm trying to assign a character string to a numeric variable in this particular case. And we won't worry too much about what's in the rest of the program other than I do have an exception section here. Now the point that we're looking at here is that the exception section of a particular block can only trap errors that are raised in the executable section of that block. So like in this case here where I'm trying to assign a default value to a variable in the declare section, that error is not going to be picked up by the exception section and it's going to be propagated unhandled out of this particular program. And you can see that down below when it actually ran there. Rather than falling to my exception section, I just put down there a very simple message of error handled. You can see I just get a, an unhandled uh, exception message down there saying that I have a numeric or value error, uh, character to numeric uh, to number conversion error type thing. Um, we know that Oracle, just like other vendors as well, will try to do implicit conversions where possible. You know, so if I didn't have the A on there and I just had one, two, three in quotes, that would be perfectly fine. He would do an implicit conversion, but in this case he can't. And so since that initialization or that assignment happened outside of the begin-end block where the exception section is defined, my program just terminated with an unhandled exception. Now, I know a lot of times in the class we talk about, in our classes we talk about initializing variables and there are certain types of variables that have to be initialized in the declare section like constants or variables that are declared to be not null. Um, but in this case it's just a regular old variable. We're not doing anything in particular with it. So instead of assigning a value, an initialization value to a variable in the declare section, maybe instead we'll assign that value in the executable section. Or we could actually you know, create another package specification or call a procedure at this point that does the initializations for us. But the whole point here is to do that initialization in the begin end block. As you can see here, I now assign the value of A123 to the variable V amount, v amount not in the declare section, but in the begin or the executable section. And when I've done that, here, you know, the end result is supposed to be the same. The variable gets a value, but since it's a data type mismatch here, you can see in this case, rather than falling out with an unhandled exception, it gave me, it fell to my exception section in that particular begin end block, and the way, I just put a when others in there to handle it, at, just to demonstrate the point, and printing out a message saying error handled, and you can see down below it did behave differently this time. Okay, so you can see it, it printed out my message error handled. So the exception of the fact that I was doing a data type mismatch was indeed handled. Not necessarily the best way to handle it, but just to prove our point here. Um, but just by moving the initialization, the how the error was actually uh, reacted to changed in this case. So that's our first one there. So first best practice there is to not necessarily initialize all your variables um, unless they have to be or are required to be in your declare section. Do that in the executable section or down in the executable section, like I said, call a procedure, maybe a standard procedure that does all the initialization for you at that point. So something like that. All right. Remember, as we go through here, if you, if you think of questions, write those down or hang on to those and send those to me in the email at jmullins at themasync.com. And I read email all day long, every day, and so I'll get back to you as quickly as I can on that. All right, let's look at our next one here. All 
All right, um, next one has to do with, um, we're reading data, but we have the intent that the data that we're reading, um, we might update. So many of you are going to be familiar with the, the four update clause that we can have on a select statement. Here I have it as part of a cursor. So I just have a cursor in this case that's doing a join between three tables. And uh, I have the intent as that I cur go through that cursor step by step, row by row, that I, based on some criteria, I might update the current record that I'm working with there. Now in this case here, as soon as I add that for update, the locking mechanism in Oracle changes at that point. You know, if I just do a regular select in the cursor there without the for update, I'm going to have some shared locks put on that data that I'm reading there. That means that other programs, other processes would be able to do updates or deletes against that same data because in Oracle, readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. However, in this, tent, uh, this case here, my intent is, after I read the data, I may be making a change to it. And to avoid conflicts with other processes, because writers do block writers, I'm going to put this for update clause on here. Now, there's a couple different ways we can do the for update here. And in this case, I just said for update. And I didn't specify which columns I might be updating at all. Um, with that in mind, you know, behind the scenes, Oracle says, well, I'm going to lock the records that this query is going to return, but since you didn't really specify to me which columns might be involved, and you're involving more than one table in this case, I have no choice but to lock every record that's coming back, in this case, from these three tables. And so I may be locking more records than I need to. Plus, from, just from a readability standpoint, you know, we talk a lot about self-documenting code out there. Um, this isn't very self-documenting. I'm just saying I'm going to read these records. I may change the records. And I'm not really saying what, I, what my intent is as far as which columns within these records I'm going to be changing. So a better way to approach this is, as you can see on this next slide here, Rather than just saying for update, I should say for update of, and then which fields or columns I'm going to be updating in this case. So here I'm saying for update of salary. So my intent is if you look down below in the code, I'm checking the salary that I just read to see if it's less than 42,000. If it is, I'm going to do an update and give um, that particular record, that salary record that I just read, a 10% increase. And I'm using there the where current of clause rather than just saying where uh, employee ID equals. But the, the point of this particular topic here is that by specifying the of salary up above, one, I make my code more self-documenting, easier, more um, obvious of what's my intent within this particular code. And plus, he only has to lock the records that are associated with the salary field which are in the employee private table. Salary doesn't show up in the other tables in this case. So my locking is going to be at a different level. My program is going to be more self-documenting. Those are the benefits I'm going to see here by changing my code just a little bit. Okay, so that's another one of the, the common practices, best practices that I've seen and used uh, in the past and I just wanted to share that with you here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. Ah, okay, this one comes up a lot. Okay, I have variables. We know that when we declare those variables, we're going to give them data types. Um, we can give them just the, the native data type, like in this case, the person's or employee's name. We know it's going to be a variable length character string. We can use the varchar2 as the, the data type for this and some length, maximum length that we want to give it. Now the problem we run into here is if we're going to declare our, our, our variables with these data types in this manner, we have to have some idea of what that maximum length is going to be for that particular data type. So in this case here I gave it a 20, for example. I may be giving it way too many uh, maximum length type positions on there, but it is variables. Um, but, but I also may be giving it not enough in that case there. Um, and so this will 
well, this will work as long as the data fits within the, that particular length within that data type for that variable. But what if it's longer than that? And we talk about this a lot in classes, and you guys are already familiar with this. So many of you might be, but we also want to bring it up because it is on my list of best practices here. Instead of hard coding that, we want to instead what's called anchor uh, the, that data type for that particular variable against a column in a table that's out on, in our database there. So instead of doing that, we'll use the percent type attribute. So you can see here I've got the VE name, my variable name, um, and I'm going to have a table name called emp and a column name called e name within that table, and I'm giving it the percent type attribute. So that what that tells it is that at compile time, if this is a compiled program, or at in interpreted time, if this is an anonymous block, which it looks like it is here, um, it's going to go out and get the data type associated with the e name column in the emp table and assign it to that variable. All right. It's not going to do that at runtime, so some people might say, well, that, we're adding a lot of overhead to our system by doing this. You know, it's not doing that at runtime. If this is a compiled program, like a store procedure or function or trigger, it's going to go out only at compile time and, and then store that result in the compiled version of this code. Now, if the data type that this represents changes after it's been compiled, that compiled program gets marked invalid, and the next time that program is tried to be executed, um, if it's not a, a uh, distributed uh, type function or distributed type data or remote data from one database to another, in other words, everything's local, then it can, on the fly, as we try to execute it, he'll recognize it's invalid and try to uh, recompile it, and if it's successful, go ahead and run it. So there's lots of benefits, advantages, pluses to using the percent type attribute. All right, because we're, we're thinking about every time we make a change to a structure of the database, we're always asking, okay, what's going to be the impact of this? Uh, which programs are going to be impacted? What is the impact of it? What's the likelihood that's going to cause problems? Things like that. This is going to cut down on those things. The percent row type's a little bit different. It's going to refer to not just a single data type for a single column, but for an entire record. So in this case, I wanted to put that in there, um, even though it's not our major point on this particular topic, this slide. But I have a variable here called vemp rec, and then I have a table name called emp, and I'm saying emp percent row type. So that's getting the the record length for the emp table and giving it to the variable called vemp rec, which then becomes not just a variable that holds a single value, but it's what's called a PLSQL uh, record type at that point, which, which looks just like the record type for the EMP table in the database. So rather than hard coding data types as num number or as varchar or date or whatever, the point of this one is to take advantage of the percent type attribute let Oracle do the work to get the data type for you so you don't have mismatches, so you don't have data types that are um, inefficient or, or inaccurate as far as length go. This will take care of that for you. And, and this is always a good best practice that we recommend, and a lot of people do take advantage of it. Plus, you know, as you're writing the code, you don't have to go out and look up the data types. Even though it is very easy to look up the data types, say, in particular tools like SQL Developer, you don't have to when using this type here. All right, so let's take a look at the next one here. Um, very simple program here. The dot, dot, dot just represents there might be some more code in this particular program. Probably there is. But notice what we've got going on here. We've got a PLSQL program, and in that PLSQL program, we have an SQL statement. And we talk about this a lot in our classes as well. So if you've been in some of the classes, you've heard this before. If not, this might be the first time. Um, we know that we can have embedded SQL in a PLSQL program, and, and we are likely to have that out there. Um, here's a real simple example. I just want today's date and time, and a lot of people in their programs will have this because their program maybe uses today's date and time as a timestamp in some sort of a, a multi-step process that's out there, and it's very simple to get that just by selecting sysdate into some variable from from dual, for example, and dual's just our dummy table with one record in it. 
um, similar to what some of the other vendors have there. However, in this case here, especially if this were uh, a select statement that was embedded inside a loop, because maybe every, maybe every time through the loop it performs a certain task. And as we enter the loop, we want to capture the date and time, and, and when we en exit the loop, get the date and time again, so we know how much time we've spent in that particular loop. Well, when we have these embedded SQL in there, the PLSQL engine does not understand SQL statements like select, insert, update, delete. So as I hit those types of statements in there, it has to do what's called a context switch and says, okay, um, I'm going to pass this over to the SQL engine. The SQL engine is going to process it. We're going to exchange data back and forth. So SQL engine, when you process the statement, just give it back to me and I'll put it in a PLSQL variable and off we'll go. So, you know, the problem there is the more SQL statements that get executed over and over within my program, that's a performance hit in a bad way. Okay, so even things like, we look at this and we say, well, this select statement, it doesn't take any resources at all, right? It runs really fast. Um, you know, there's no joins involved. It's, it's a very simple statement. It doesn't take much time. You know, how is this a problem to my system? Well, just the fact that it's an SQL statement is a problem. And like I said, the more time, if you're only running it once, not a big deal. But if this is embedded somewhere where it's getting executed many times, then all of a sudden it becomes a bigger problem. A better way to write this particular statement, even though it's very simple, would be something like this. All right. I'm going to still capture today's date and time into a variable, but I'm not going to do it through an SQL statement. So here I have v underscore sysdate equals sysdate. It's going to go out and execute the function called sysdate, return the results from it, assign it to the variable, and I avoid the context switch. So if you have any statements at all where you can do something like this, and so that's why you'll see sometimes one of the other best practices that some of the other people that I work with and know will say, you know, embed, take your SQL statements and maybe embed them into a function rather than having them embedded directly into your main program or something. So then you can refer to the function and don't have to refer to the statement, even though the function internally is running the statement itself. But that way we can also share that particular statement amongst other programs as well. So here's a, here's a good example of that. Now, I want to follow up on this as well. This was a very simple example of kind of avoiding the SQL statement and still getting the same answer. Um, what if we do something like this as well? Take a look at this one. It should have popped up there for you. All right. Um, bulk collect, so bulk processing. Um, especially for inserts, updates, and deletes, this can be a, a huge savings in performance. All right? If instead of having a, a for loop or a while loop or a simple loop, and embedded in that loop I have an insert, update, or delete, I can work with my collection type of data types, save data in those, and then as you can see in these two examples here, that update statement at the bottom of the screen, that's not a standalone statement. That's a part of the for all statement. So this case here, we're doing a for all where we're basically telling Oracle how many items are in the arrays that I'll be processing. Because we look at for all and we say, well, isn't that a loop also? It's not a loop also, right? You don't see the word loop there anywhere, right? So the for all is just another statement. It's just telling Oracle how many items are in these arrays. Notice these arrays down here below in the set clause and in the where clause. These are all array data types down here, either associative arrays or nested tables or whatever. So down here, we'd, in this case here, if I was going to update, we're updating what? The order total um, by some amount here where the order ID equals a certain order ID at this point. Okay, so in this case here, rather than doing that one, passing that update one at a time over to the SQL engine, we're going to gather up everything in these arrays and we're going to do one context switch over to the database, to the SQL engine, and we're going to process all the items in these arrays and then come back with the results. 
Okay, so the, whole, the name of the game on this slide and, the, and the, the couple prior to this is the best practices, reduce context switches, even on the very simplest of statements like selecting from dual, but even then you could also do it on the more complex, say when using arrays or collections if we want to call them there. And here's some good examples of that. And if you want some examples of these, you could go out to our website and all these slides are available to you out there. All right, we're getting through here. We're about through, actually, not too far off. So hang with me a little bit longer. You guys are doing great. Um, here's the next one here. Um, this one also has to do with collections um, as well. We know that, like with the associative array and the nested table, those particular collection types can be what's called sparse, which means they don't have to have an item in every cell of that particular collection. So here. I did a very simple array up here at the top. It's just an array or collection of numbers. Assigned it to a variable called V underscore numbers. And then what I did is I assigned position 1 of the collection to 100 and position 5 of the collection to 500. And then I went out and used the first method for collections which says uh, return back to me the index of the, of the array where the first position has data. So it might be in, in position number one or zero or whatever that is. So I'm just grabbing the first position that has data in this, in this case. And then I'm going to go into a while loop. So I'm saying while i is not null loop, and I'm just printing out the items in the array, which should be 100 and 500, as you can see here. All right, so first time through the loop, I print it out. I get a 100, just like you see down at the bottom. And then I increment i by 1, and this is a very common practice that people will have some sort of a, a loop counter, whether it's with a for loop where it's declared for you, a simple loop where you have to do it yourself, or with a while loop like here where I've had to declare it myself as well. So I increase i to get the what's in the second position of the collection. Well, as look up here above, there is nothing in the second position of the collection. And so when I try to do the put line for position number 2, it fails and it gives me this error and it says it's a no data found exception basically. Okay, so it says no data found, found at line 11, so it failed. It never let, it never let me get to position number 5 for example. So this, in this particular code that we're looking at here as far as the best practice goes, the best practice is one common way to get around this type of error. Instead of having your own variables and doing your own incrementation of those variables, we're going to do something like this. Notice the code is basically the same throughout. I'm still getting the first index of the collection that has a value. And then I'm coming in here and saying while i is not null, just like before, print out the, the position in the array. But instead of doing i equals i plus 1, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the next, what's called the next method. It's, it's called next, just like first and last, or count. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to assign i to v numbers, which is the array or collection name, dot next, sub i. And what that's going to do is it's going to return the index of the next position in the array that has a value, which in this case should not be 2, 3, or 4. It should be position number 5. And then when I loop back up, it's going to print out what's in position number 5, which should be the 500. Um, and then... Um, I'm going to fall out of the loop, and you can see down below, I do not get the error of the data not found. I get the 100 and the 500, just like I expected, and it's successfully completed. Okay, so the common practice, the best practice here is, instead of stepping through the array, especially these sparse arrays that you have, instead of stepping through them one at a time, unless you know that even though the array can be sparse, that it isn't in this case, go ahead and use the next method instead of just incrementing it yourself. So you don't want to find a surprise where, hey, what happened to position number 10? My program now dies, and I need to take care of that somehow. Okay, so in that case there, use the, use the methods that are available for the collections. That's the best practice that we're looking at there. All right, I'm sure you've run into lots of different uh, exceptions or errors in Oracle programs, right? Every once in a while anyway, right? I know you guys write some really good code out there, but take a look at this. I've hard-coded this on purpose to 
force it into an error, for example. So in this particular case, when I do an insert into the department table, this third value out here represents a manager ID, and this is going to violate a foreign key, okay, um, which is an ORA-2291 uh, error. The common practice or a best practice here is we know that some of Oracle's errors are associated with names as far as named exceptions go, like a no data found or such. But, but many of their errors, since they have so many of them, are not associated with names. So like in this case, the error is going to be an ORA-2291. But that does not have a name associated with it. Now, we can still handle a 2291 with, without giving it a name. But by giving it a name, we make our program more self-documenting. We make it more readable, easier to maintain, um, all those types of things. So the best practice or common practice here is rather than just handling Oracle's uh, error numbers that don't have names, that we give them names ourselves. Okay. So if we take a look here, here's how we can do that. We'll declare a user-defined exception like we see here at the top. All right. So we can see we've done, I have a variable called v underscore 2291 underscore error. It's an exception. And then we're going to use the pragma exception init. So the pragma is just a directive to the compiler where we're saying we're going to associate any Oracle error numbers 2291 with the user defined exception that I already have up above. So now the 2291 Oracle error has, it's, it's just like a no data found type of exception now. It has its own name. And make sure we give it what? A very descriptive, meaningful name so that when we're looking at the code, you know, it doesn't go for, for naught in this case. So then down below, you know, instead of handling it with a when others or such, I'm going to go ahead and handle it with a, a descriptive, meaningful name in my exception section. Makes my exception sections look more readable, more self-documenting as well. And I get a, a I have a, a section down here for, that says what? When V underscore 2291 underscore error, then do something. And the point of this presentation isn't to say, okay, here's a good way to handle it, because put line typically isn't a good way to handle it. We're just showing that we can in this case. So the, the common practice, best practice on this particular topic here is for those Oracle error numbers that you know you're going to encounter along the way, that, and, and this will take some time to kind of build up a library of your own and maybe you're going to put these in a, a stored procedure that's going to handle all this stuff or in a, in a, in a package specification uh, program. Um, but to give the Oracle error numbers names, because they've already done it for you already with some of them. So that sounds like if, they, if this is going to be a good practice, sounds like we're going to be copying a practice that Oracle's already doing. It's just that they didn't apply it to the majority of the errors because there's what? There's thousands of error numbers. Error numbers. Some are going to be um, applied to you and some of them won't. Okay? And like I said, some of these are real minor. You may look at them and say, yeah, okay, fine. Um, I'm probably not going to do that. But a lot of people, this, this is a very common practice for them to do. And, you know, making your program self-documenting, that's a big deal. Um, it's something that's been kind of gaining momentum the last couple of years, um, make those programs more readable, easier to maintain, which means we're taking less time to update them, change them, customize them, whatever there. All right, let's take a look at one here. Um, this, here's the scenario on this one, and we're about through here on these as well. Um, I've done an update, okay? And now, a lot of times in people's programs, when they do, they're changing data or manipulating data, one of the things they want to do later in their program is go, go back and make use of the new values, at, say, in, like in this case, after the update. So in this case, I did an update. I changed everyone's salary, increased it by 10%. Now, later in the program, I may want to check out or do something with their new salaries, not their old salaries that were out there. So a lot of people, what they'll do at that point, if I've done an update earlier in the program, later in the program, to get those new salaries, 
they issue another select statement because their session can see the new salaries even though they haven't committed them yet. So they do another select. In this case, I made it a a, a bulk collect. It didn't, a lot of people, they, they don't even make it a bulk collect. They'll just make it a cursor, an explicit cursor, and they're reading the records one at a time, and that's going to slow us down. You know, reading those one at a time isn't the best way to do that. So I tried to improve it a little bit by doing the bulk collect here, but just by doing the bulk collect even, what have I done? I've issued an SQL select statement, which I really don't need to in order to see the new values that have just been updated. So instead of issuing another SQL statement, which is that context switch, to avoid that with the update statement, for example, use the returning clause. And you can say that they have the returning with bulk collect as well. So here I'm updating everyone's record and I'm giving them a 10% increase in salary just like before, but now I'm going to return the new salary. I'm going to bulk collect that into an array. And now later in my program, if I want to see the new side, and I could also grab their employee ID or whatever that goes with it so I have more, I uh, know which salaries go with who or whatever. But I just wanted to show you this particular example to, to demonstrate this point. Adding the return to the update, I don't have to do another SQL statement in order to see the new salaries. I can grab the new salaries as part of the update statement, and when it's done, I've got them. And then if I need them later, I can use them later. All right. The whole point here is take advantage of the clauses that are available with, say, insert updates or deletes. In this case, it's an update with a returning instead of having to do another SQL statement. And that's a very, very common uh, best practice that people take advantage of there. All right. I saved this one for last because this is probably the easiest one of the bunch. It's kind of wrap stuff up here. I have a few other things to say after this slide, so hang on. But um, this is what adds, you know, maybe, you know, dozens of other uh, conventions that we should follow, other standards we should follow, other best practices we should follow. And these are very simple things, not necessarily related to how we write our code, which is what we looked at today, but things like, you know, what are you going to name your PLSQL variables? What's, what, are, what are good best practices for that? Um, parameter names. Do you, are you going to distinguish between a, a variable that's a parameter and a variable that's just local to the program by the name that you have there. That's a best practice that a lot of people use and I recommend it too. So your parameter names might be P underscore and your variable names in your local program might be V underscore. Otherwise a lot of people just say V underscore for everything and that works perfectly fine but then the program itself isn't as self-documenting and isn't as readable as it could be. What are you going to name your cursors? Uh, your different types that you create, especially if you're creating types and you're putting them in package specifications that you're going to share across many programs. Um, like varchar2 is a data type. You're going to create a new type and you're going to put it in a package spec and maybe it's in a, a collection type for something and other programs are going to access it. We want some sort of a standard name there so that we're not all over the board and it, it helps make, the, again, the programs more easy to understand in that case. And then, of course, you know, at the higher level there, you know, what are you just going to name your store procedure? And a lot of you already have some of these standards in place. And it's not just standard naming conventions, but also standard abbreviations. Are you going to abbreviate department, you know, different ways or the same way throughout all your programs, however you're going to refer to it there. So that's kind of a, a good way to kind of wrap up some of those. And like I said, these are just some of the common best practices that came to my mind as I was thinking about today's webinar. And I'll probably follow it up with a part two with some others that come up uh, as well. All right, to kind of wrap up here, um, if you do have any questions, there's my uh, email address, jmullins at themasinc.com. Um, I get questions all the time, so feel free to send any of those, either from today's webinar or if you have questions about Oracle or any of our courses that are available to us as well. Remember our website as well out there on the system, themasync.com. Remember, it's been newly been changed. It looks fantastic. It's easy to get around in. You can see information about all our courses out there. 
Um, we have another webinar for DB2 type people, so if you have some friends that are DB2 people, here's our, our next webinar. It's going to be on Thursday, April 27th, and we're talking about, um, you can see the topic there for the DB2 group there. All right, and if you want more information, like I said, go to our website, themasinc.com. Um, you can also email not only me, but you can also email John Cacavell if you have questions about classes, customizing classes, classes at your site, public sites, online type of places. And remember, you can get a copy of today's presentation. The slides are already out there at themasinc.com slash webinars or go to themasinc.com at the top. Click on webinars. The slides are there. The presentation will be out there a little bit later on. Give us some time to put that out there for sure. But uh, oh, hopefully, we've talked about in the 45 minutes or so that we had here today, um, just mention some of the best practices that I've run across that uh, I've seen other people use at other places as well that they'll you know, help you, you know, implement those into your own PL SQL environment where you, you can get, you know, kind of gain the advantage of uh, easier to read code, more reliable code, self-documenting code, Maybe an added bonus of the code performs a little bit better as well. And, and that applies to not only your code, but other code that you have to look at too. So in other words, your coworkers. So I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, it's Thursday already, so everybody have a good end to your week. And again, if you have any questions, let me know at jmullins at themasinc.com. I'll be more than happy to get back to you. If we need to talk by phone, we can do that as well. All right, thank you again, everybody, and have a good day.